Good afternoon. Let's do some business. We're doing it live right here, doing more at four weekday afternoons. We get right down to business with the News Driven Hour right after Ben Shapiro. And just before the 790 KBC News Blitz, it's Motec on Money live on the air of 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at KBC.com and you're on demand. Motec on Money podcast, KBC.com, Apple iTunes and all your favorite podcast platforms coming in fast and furious. All eyes on Hurricane Milton taking aim at the Florida West Coast, aiming for the Tampa Bay area. We'll have coverage on all that uh, this evening. Stocks finishing solidly higher with investors unfazed by the notes from the Fed's last big policy setting meeting as they look ahead to a consumer price index reading that will be coming out first thing tomorrow morning that might have more significance amid signs of a resilient economic growth picture. The Dow coming in for a closing gain of 432 points, hitting a record high, topping the record finish we saw on Friday. The S&P 500 of 41 points. It, too, stands at an all-time high. And the Nasdaq moving up 109 points, settling at 18,000. 291, just shy of its all-time high, about, uh, let's see, about 400 points now off its record high. That was set back in July. Fed funds futures now pricing in about a 21% probability the Fed will leave rates unchanged next month after taking in the notes from the Fed's last policy-setting meeting, and that's up from just under 15% earlier, according to the Fed Watch tool we keep track of here. Trump media stock taking a break from its big two-week rally, slipping 4%. Hurricane Milton approaching the Gulf Coast of Florida could have an impact on businesses in a number of sectors, including building materials, banks, and hotels. Interestingly, the cruise business, uh, cruise line stocks, rallied today. Hurricane Milton is set to hit Florida in the coming hours. All sorts of travel plans have been upended. Theme parks, airports, and ports in the state have closed down. Looks like uh, we're watching big changes in cruise itineraries today. Certain destinations being skipped over to avoid weather-related issues. Cruise line stocks were among the big winners today. For example, Norwegian Caribbean shares up about 11%. Carnival up 7% and Royal Caribbean moving up 5%. I'll discuss what's happening later this hour in preparation for Hurricane Milton with the cruise guy himself, Stuart Chiron, president of cruiseguy.com, will be joining me live from Florida later this hour. But first, on your money, the markets, the economy, and the whole works now. Joining us live is Michael Farr, Chief Market Strategist at Hightower Advisors and President of the D.C. Investment Advisory Firm, Farr Miller in Washington, also CNBC contributor. See him all the time on CNBC, author of numerous books, including A Million Is Not Enough. Michael Farr, thank you very much for coming to the line here this afternoon. Frank, it's great to be with you again. Great to hear your voice. Uh, It's always fun. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you with us. It's been a while since we chatted behind the live microphones and uh, and our many interactions over the years. Uh, I know you have a place in Florida. Hopefully everything is okay there, that you've evacuated from the West Coast and everybody's safe there. Well, the house is, the house is as secure as it can be. We're in Naples, Florida, and we're on the water. And when you have a house in Florida, Frank, or on the water anywhere, you know it comes with inherent risks. So, Uh, We have done everything we can do. The insurance premiums are paid, and now we kind of say our prayers and hope for the best, but uh, that Mother Nature will spare us. Uh, But we're certainly saying our prayers, too, for so many people who were in harm's way. I'm just so grateful for those who decided to evacuate and so worried for those who haven't. Please uh, stay safe, everybody who's listening tonight. Certainly, and we wish everyone all the best in this uh, catastrophic storm that's expected to hit the, in the next day or so. Uh, Michael Farr, again, thank you very much for taking this call at this critical moment. And uh, in the meantime, uh, record highs for both the Dow and uh, the S&P 500, and interestingly, the cruise line stocks, which cruise lines have certainly been impacted by this uh, storm as well, uh, moving higher. Give us your view of the markets here, uh, first of all. Well, markets are trading uh, at all-time highs. Um, So if the old rule is to buy low, this certainly isn't. Um, With that said, I think the most important thing, Frank, that an investor can look at and pay attention to right now amid all of this noise from global events to hurricanes and, and political and everything else is that the Federal Reserve has changed course on monetary policy and interest rates. They're coming down now. Whether the economy has a soft landing or not, hard landing, it looks like a soft landing, but folks, a landing is a landing. It means you're coming down. And they're looking, therefore, for economic data, 
and economic conditions to continue to soften. So this isn't going to feel great, but, you know, like when the 747 lands, it's, it's typically pretty smooth. They don't just jar and shake your fillings out of your teeth. We hope that that's going to happen with the economy. Uh, we have 27 days to this election, but the most important thing going on out there right now is that the Fed has changed course. And Chair Powell said something, Frank, I, 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 want, you, I want to ask you. I have never heard a Fed chairman say, we're going to have two more cuts at the next two meetings. Never in my 37 years. And so I would take the man at his words. I heard you talk about the odds of future cuts and what the number is and this and that. Uh-uh. Jay Powell said it. Take it to the bank. Have you heard him say it? And what do you think? You're absolutely right. Uh, I've not heard that, um, that laid out that way. Uh, we go way back uh, to the days uh, of Alan Greenspan, where we had to uh, interpret what uh, he said, which was often difficult. I remember uh, you knew Paul Kangas very well from the Nightly Business Report. Paul and I oh, yeah. used to joke that we need, used to have the we need to use the uh, a Green Spanish Dictionary to figure out uh, what the Fed chairman uh, said back in those days. Uh, so Jerome Powell was he um, said, is, is much mean, clearer. Greenspan even said that if if you ever think you understand what I've said, I've said it wrong. <laughs> so things def- definitely have changed, uh, certainly un- under Bernanke and then uh, uh, Yellen, and now we have um, Chairman Powell here, and and um, and we did get the notes from that last meeting. Any big takeaways, for any signals that you picked up there uh, based on uh, what you heard about um, the economy and the discussion that led to that uh, out- oversized uh, cut of, of a half a percentage point and, and more concern now focus on, on the job picture rather than the inflation, which is coming down, but it's still higher than where the Fed wants it. You know, like you, Frank, I've gotten to know through this great privilege of being on the airways for so many years. I've had the privilege also of getting to know different Fed presidents and uh, Fed governors. Um, I- I've known Chairman Powell for, oh, I don't know, 30 years. Um, he does not call me uh, to ask me what I think uh, he should do with the economy. I've been very disappointed, Frank, that he doesn't, but he doesn't. Uh, I was not... <laughs> I was not particularly surprised to see that there was a broad number of dissents, some thinking they should have done a quarter of a point, half a point. I think in the long run, the most important thing here is the direction. The Fed is no longer longer removing accommodation. They are not really adding. They're not adding, but they're taking their foot off the brake a bit and see if we can kind of come to a coasting stop. Tomorrow's a big number with CPI. It's a big number coming out. Markets are going to be watching it. Fed says they still have a sort of a 2% target. We're expected to see an annual rate of 2.2%, just a monthly gain of 1%, one-tenth of a percent. This means that the rate of inflation is slowing. Prices are still going up, and core is expected, uh, projected to be 3.2% and, a, and an increase of two-tenths of a percent. That isn't the 2% they want, but um, we've seen a bit of a blip here. The Fed may really feel like they have more work to do. I think you expect Powell to cut two more times exactly what he said. Anything else I think could look political, and he's got to just ease markets into this. Curiously, while uh, all this is happening, uh, we're seeing the – we're seeing the yield on the 10-year note uh, heat up uh, lately. In fact, let me take a peek here right now. The yield on the 10-year note, which I didn't mention earlier. Uh, has uh, perked up uh, recently above 4%. Um, what is that telling us? And, and is the bond market once again uh, competing uh, with the stock market here? Well, I think so. And we remember with, with the 10-year Treasury also tells you what's going on with money and interest rates around the world. They've been moving up a little bit. But a 407 on the 10-year Treasury as the Fed's backing off on the short end, 402 on the two-year Treasury. And wonky uh, folks and economists pay a lot of attention to what a two-year yield is, which is 402, and a 10-year yield is a 407. That can have some folks scratching their heads saying, gee, I only get paid five one-hundredths of one percent to own this thing for another eight years. Yes, that's the answer, except that it was inverted. It used to be uh, just a few weeks ago that you would get paid more. The yield was higher on the two-year. It's always a negative sign for the economy when the yield curve is inverted, when that two-year is higher than the 10-year. So we have a normalized curve sort of of five basis points, 402 to 407. Um, I think the market's settling into this idea, uh, really, of the new Jerusalem that the Fed is trying to explain to us, explain to us, and what it's going to mean going into 2025. 
I think the Fed is going to continue to move at a very deliberate pace and really try and be data dependent, even though it sort of feels like Jay Powell just came out with two more rate cuts at the end of this year at the next two meetings. Doesn't sound data dependent. Sounds like we've made up our mind. We're going to be data independent for the next couple of meetings. On the air live with Michael Farr, and let me ask you this, um, gold still hovering near its all-time high, just at a time we're told that inflation is supposedly cooling down, the gold hitting above 2700 recently. Um, what do you make of that and, uh, and the big move uh, we've seen in gold lately? Frank, I, I think the gold move has been fascinating. You know, uh, inflation is still happening, albeit at a slower rate. There's also a flight to safety trade, of course, with gold. Um, where, where people just feel better when they own it. On a larger scale, I now may, this is me showing my age, folks. I'm 63 years old, and I worry about the size of the national debt. I worry that the deficit is $1.8 trillion. I worry that the government doesn't seem to be worried about all of the money that it's printing, that the debt it's issuing is going to be paid back by future generations of Americans. And the only way to cure this amount of debt with our level of GDP is to monetize it and to inflate it. So I think gold is sending another message. uh, And to me, uh, that message is, is, is warranted, which is pay attention to the damn debt. It's too much and nobody's doing anything about it. Watch gold on that. All right. It's been a while since uh, we've uh, chatted here. And uh, have you come around uh, on cryptos? We uh, talked to the biggest fans of crypto here, as well as the harshest critics. Uh, I'm sure you're paying attention to what's happening with, with Bitcoin and the, and the other uh, crypto uh, choices out there. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on crypto here? You know, did you ever watch that movie Big with Tom Hanks? Um, he, yep. he sits around the table when they come up with some sort of new uh, toy, and he just looks there, looks at him and says, I don't get it. Well, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't know what makes it worth more. I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's not backed by anything. It's not a fiat. It doesn't have a fiat from anybody. There's no guarantee that there is going to be another buyer. It looks like, you know, more people may want this stuff, and they're not even sure why. Um, it's, it's, it's weird stuff. It sure seems like it's here to stay. Uh, I do own a little bit of it. Uh, I've lost money on paper on it because I haven't sold it. But and may, I don't think I'd feel differently if I, I did make money for a while on it. And I don't understand why. I, I thought I'd own it so that I could figure it out. And that hasn't helped. It goes up and goes down in ways that I can't conceive of or understand. So I don't get it, Frank, but God bless you if it's working for you. Well, I appreciate your honesty. I, I haven't really seen really any reliable analysis uh, myself. Uh, it goes up uh, because it goes up. It goes down because it goes down. That seems to be the only plausible uh, explanation, uh, even uh, to this point, right? You got and, it. Uh, I think trying that's to figure it. out. <laughs> that's it. You got <laughs> we, it. We finally that's figured it, it out. Got it. Listen to Frank. Absolutely. Well, thanks for uh, for concurring there, and, and we will. Um, and God bless those who, who are trying to figure it out. And certainly, we we talk to those folks as well. Or, who seem to be very bullish uh, on um, on cryptos, especially depending on what happens with the the upcoming uh, election here. So uh, we're all focused on uh, that as well. And um, I'm sure uh, you've you've taken a look at, at the possible uh, scenarios here, um, given the, the two choices uh, uh, at the ballot box uh, in November. Um, have you done any analysis on that? Uh, what uh, one choice or the other would mean uh, for the, for the markets and the economy? Well, we have, of course, 27 days until the presidential election, and it doesn't look like on the 28th day we may actually know who the president-elect will be. However, as you look, I'm from Washington. I used to walk past the Capitol building every day on my way to high school. I'd walk right past the Library of Congress, and then I'd walk past the Supreme Court. It was stunning, and you get to know these politicians, but the one thing you see is that both policies are calling for more uh, deficit spending, both uh, the potential uh, Harris policies and the Trump policies are going to have more spending. Nobody's going to curtail spending. So one spends more than the other. Neither one looks to be particularly positive for the economy, as from what I can see from the policies that they'll talk about. And they only talk about these policies and these vague generalities, which is so frustrating. But nobody, I mean, voters don't seem to care to hear specifics. They kind of tune out. And if it's not working with the voting public, if it's not helping them make the sale at the ballot box, 
they just shut up and don't talk about it. But for the facts they've given, you're, you're, because I'm the financial guy, neither one of them looks to be have a great solution for what we're facing economically. On the live with Michael Farr, and at this point, uh, Michael Farr, let me ask you the big question we ask uh, on this program, and I'm sure you get asked this uh, all the time, and, and that simply is, uh, where are you putting money now and or uh, taking it off the table? I've always said, Frank, that the best time to buy stocks is when you have money, and the only time to sell stocks is when you need money. Uh, I think that we have seen a beginning of a broadening out in the market. A lot of folks have a lot of profits. And in those profits are also concentrations in positions. If you've owned NVIDIA and some of these fabulous names that have gone right through the roof, you probably have too much after a while in those names. It's time to rebalance. So talk to your financial advisor. Get some good professional advice to help you follow your discipline. You'll make money in the markets by uh, not time and not timing. It's the time in the markets. When there's too much risk in a portfolio, you trim it back. And there are a lot of things out there now that haven't done very well over the last 10 years that are still earning money, that are still in the lower teens in terms of price to earnings multiples and valuations that are still growing those earnings, have good solid balance sheets. I don't think that the stock market's a place to gamble. I think it's a place to build wealth. And you do that with discipline and dogged research. Uh, and I think that if you do that, and, and move at your pace and don't worry about what the next guy's doing over on his desk. You can make money over time. You should build wealth over time and work with a good advisor who can help you keep your emotions at bay. That's the worst thing that can happen to you as an investor. Emotion is the foe of the long-term investor. Michael, thank you very much for taking the call today. Uh, we do appreciate it and hope to speak with you uh, more regularly here on this program uh, for your fans here on the West Coast of the United States. Michael Farr, Chief Market Strategist at Hightower Advisors and President of the D.C. Investment Advisory Firm Farr Miller in Washington. You see him on CNBC all the time and author of numerous books, including uh, one of them is A Million is Not Enough, an unforgettable name. Michael Farr, thank you very much for joining us. We wish you and your family all the very best and everyone in Florida all the very best in this uh, current emergency. Thank you very much uh, for taking the call here today. Thank you, Frank. Great being with you again. Likewise. Thank you very much. And right now to the freeways now on 790 KBC. Frank Motek here. Did you know that for more than 10,000 years, gold has been the greatest store of value and considered a safe haven asset to preserve your wealth? Now, with the U.S. debt at more than $35 trillion in climbing, not to mention the Biden administration getting us involved in costly wars, developing the digital dollar, central bank digital currency, and inflation still spiraling, it's more critical now than ever before to safeguard your assets, like your cash savings and retirement accounts, with physical gold. Opening a gold IRA is one of the best ways to secure your wealth and create a stable financial future. Stop worrying about your retirement and the market and cash savings in the bank. Feel confident, prepared, and in control with physical gold and silver. Give Joe Morgan a call at 1-800-753-8534. Mention yours truly, Frank Motek, and you could get $1,000 worth of silver with a qualifying purchase. 1-800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. Motek on Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good afternoon. Record shattering day for stocks. The cruise lines also shot higher today in the face of Hurricane Milton. Bearing down on the state of Florida might be impacting uh, the ports. Already, of course, uh, ports closed throughout Florida pretty much, uh, and we're watching the uh, situation there with um, megastorm uh, Hurricane Milton coming into the west coast of Florida in the next day or so. I'll be talking about uh, the cruise business and how it's being impacted. Stuart Chiron, the cruise industry expert, president of CruiseGuy.com, will be joining us live later this hour. We see uh, NCL shares up nearly 11% today, Carnival shares up 7%, and Royal Caribbean stock up 5% among the biggest movers in the S&P 500 today in what was a record-shattering day for both the S&P 500 and for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow popped more than 400 points higher, up 432 at 42,512. Uh, we see the S&P 500 moving up uh, 41 points to 5,792, and the NASDAQ gained 109 points at 18,292. The yield on the 10-year note is back up to 4.07%. Checking the cryptos now, Bitcoin down about 400 now at 60,565. Ethereum up four at 2,363. And let's bring up Doge, which many of our listeners follow. 
Dogecoin hanging in there at 11 cents. Taking a look at uh, shares of NVIDIA, let's see if we can bring up the uh, Magnificent One here. Magnificent One uh, pulling back slightly today after popping recently, down 24 cents at 132.65. And Apple, which has been at or near record highs, uh, pulling back today down at, make that up, make that up, please, up nearly $4 at 229.54 it had taken a slight dip uh, yesterday but higher today google shares coming under pressure down two dollars 52 cents at 161.86 and now the latest news here on 790 kbc motego money continues from 790 kbc the lapd is a new chief jim mcdonald veteran law enforcement professional has been on the show many times He's got a big job now dealing with the crime in los angeles also recruiting new officers the former la county sheriff jim mcdonald will be the new chief of the Los Angeles Police Department, taking charge of the department, which remains understaffed. So hiring is going to be a big part uh, of the job that uh, Chief McDonald has. Of course, uh, crime is another big issue. Let's bring in another law enforcement veteran now, former L.A. City Council member, the Honorable Dennis Zine, is on the line with me right now. Good afternoon, uh, the Honorable Dennis Zine. Good afternoon, Frank. Pleasure to be with you. One correction. The chief has not been confirmed by the council yet. This is the mayor's recommendation. It must go through the council for confirmation and appointment. So we hope this happens, but technically, until the council confirms, he's a prospective chief of police. So, uh, and it's critical that the council come to their senses. And I would get, get, I would get money in a bet that it will not be a unanimous support by some of the members of the city council, which is reflective on some of the attitudes of the members of the L.A. City Council. I think he will win ultimately, but I don't think it will be unanimous. Just listening to some of the comments made by some of the council members that I've been very critical of uh, a number of years since uh, they haven't really shown support for law enforcement or leadership of the LAPD. I just want to make sure our listeners are aware of that situation. Appreciate that very much, and uh, we are we strive for uh, truth and accuracy here. So I appreciate you laying it out that way. Uh, what are you hearing behind the scenes about uh, how this is going to happen? Well, I'm hearing that there's some council members who are riding the fence, some council members who are reluctant to give an endorsement at this time. Maybe they will be coaxed into that, hopefully by the mayor's support. I've known Jim McDonald for many, many years. I have 55 years with the Los Angeles Police Department. So I was on before he came on the police department and I've known him through his uh, career with the LAPD, also with the uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I didn't know him. I didn't engage with him during the time at Long Beach Police Department, but he's well-versed. He's well-qualified. I mean, he's a wonderful man who has the right focus, the right balance. He'll have a challenge with the city council. I'm very open about that. And anyone can read what the council members do when it comes to the votes. It's not unanimous. It's oftentimes right on the border. Uh, but he's going to have a challenge convincing the council members. Uh, and when issues come forward, getting the support from the council members. I know he's got support from the mayor. I know there are some council members who are already going on support, saying they'd be happy to support him. But uh, the part of the process is confirmation by the city council. So we'll see how that all works out. I hope it works out. He's a good man for the job. I think he can make a lot of changes. But clearly, our numbers are lacking, 8780. The last report as of September 7th, 8780 is what the LAPD is now operating with. That's 8780 from the chief down to the recruiting academy. Clearly, insufficient number of personnel to police the city with all the challenges that it has. And on top of that, what's happening down the road with the Olympics and see some of these other international events that are going to come to Los Angeles. So clearly, Something has to be done in that arena to recruit people and retain people, and they've done a lot of stuff to try and stuff to try to retain. Uh, they're not retaining the numbers that they should to retain, that they need to retain to keep it operational and efficient and effective. Well, if indeed uh, Jim McDonald is confirmed as the LAPD chief, uh, certainly he has the uh, the tremendous experience, having served as the uh, not only uh, as an assistant chief, right, in the LAPD, also LA County Sheriff and also the chief of the Long Beach uh, Police Department, and um, certainly seems to be uh, well-prepared to handle these uh, mega events, including the the 2028 Olympics that everyone is uh, planning for now. Frank, no question. I worked the 84 Olympics. I know the challenges with the 84 Olympics. I know what we went through, 12-hour shifts for the officers. Uh, You're working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, 
uh, you didn't have a lot of time to rest. But it was an exciting time, and clearly we were there to protect and serve the people as well as the venues and the athletes. We had to protect the athletes around the clock. So it was a daunting task, but the men and women of the LAPD, many of them have retired since that time. But uh, I'm still here. I was there then, so I know what it's all about, the challenges and what it takes to make sure it's safe. Uh, that's what we want to do again. I mean, many of us are dedicated to public service. Unfortunately, some of those people on the LA City Council don't believe in public service for the benefit of all the people of Los Angeles. And I, I question that. Uh, again, I was a council member for 12 years, so I know it takes to be a council member, what it needs to be, what you need to do to make it safe for everyone. And I don't see them having that focus. Uh, again, we have a homeless situation out of control. We have crime that frightens people. Uh, you wear a Rolex watch, you're a potential victim. If you live in a nice area, you're a potential victim. I mean, it, it's critical. But I respect our police officers, our scene lead officers, our officers who are riding those patrol cars, the footbeats. Today, I was in West San Fernando Valley. I saw the horse detail. They had the mounted unit out around the Westfield Shopping Center where they recently had the smash and grab uh, once again at the high-end stores in Woodland Hills. So uh, LAPD is trying, but we need to support them, and they need to support the people, and they need to get the numbers up of personnel so they can do the job to protect everyone, not only retail crime, but residential crime and other crimes that occur in the city of the Angels. On the air live with the Honorable Dennis Zine, on the line here with Dennis Zine, and and uh, ran into that equestrian unit uh, some time ago. They they love you, uh, Dennis Zine, I have to say, and uh, they are amazing. So we we salute the uh, the equestrian um, officers uh, and and those beautiful horses uh, that they have. And now getting back to the the issue of crime, uh, it was a shock uh, when thieves. Um, Slipped the watch off Dodgers pitcher Walker Bueller's wrist uh, this past week. Um, this is just unbelievable what's happening out there. Well, people who wear expensive jewelry become a victim. And I tell people, if you have a Rolex watch, the best place for it is locked in your home. Uh, it's uh, from the Beverly Hills situation where there was a shooting. Those people went to prison uh, during the afternoon in Beverly Hills having lunch on a corner restaurant. Uh, that was a situation that revolved uh, a shooting at that particular site to steal a watch, a very expensive watch. Uh, people like to wear watches that are expensive. People dry, like to drive expensive cars. But what you're doing is you're waving the flag. you are now become a target. What I tell people is don't show your wealth. Don't drive an expensive car. What you need to do is play it down so you're not going to be a potential victim. And now many people get in CCWs. We know that's a situation. And as far as crime, let me give you this website. People need to know in their community how bad crime is in their community. You can go to lapdonline.org lapdonline.org and then punch up crime info it will pinpoint your particular neighborhood your block your number uh what's happening in your neighborhood people should look into that and see the attitude what's happening with crime in their perspective neighbor this is throughout the city of los angeles lapdonline.org crime info gives you a view exactly what's happening robberies rapes burglaries etc it's important to know that but if you've got an expensive car expensive jewelry be aware you're a potential victim they're not robbing people that uh, have a Timex watch or a watch that you <laughs> buy at the uh, retail store. They're going for the goods. And those watches, if you look online, they're extremely expensive. You're talking $10,000, $20,000 for a watch. Uh, people like to show their wealth. Unfortunately, you become the victims when you show your wealth. I think I'm going to be in the market for a 1964 Falcon after this uh, conversation here, uh, Dennis. Sign, but uh, of course, you're absolutely right, and I know you love LA and you love the people, and I want everybody to stay safe. And and uh, look at this: um, the latest polling indicates uh, Nathan Hockman on track to defeat the uh, soft on crime DA uh, George Gascon. Uh, that's another important component here, right? Uh, as we approach uh, the election. Well, it's critical. It's critical that Gascon leave office. It's interesting. I listened to a radio interview uh, yesterday uh, with the two running for District Attorney of LA County, and I thought uh, it was terrible to see what Gascon tried to do to represent himself. He was far short of convincing me, and I think that the listeners on that particular station really showed support uh, with the questions. I I submitted my uh, con congratulations to the opponent, to Mr. Gascon. I submitted my uh, email to him, my text to him. He responded back today. Thank you. Uh, he's got a lot of support, and I think that what we need to do is get a change. Just remember, don't vote no. Vote no on Gascon. Just vote no on Gascon, and you'll find a happier, safer place in the city of the Angels. In fact, not only L.A., but L.A. County, 88 cities. The district attorney represents 88 cities, and, and we have a new candidate who's going to be wonderful for that seat. All right, and your, your message to the business community, uh, hopefully uh, finally cracking down on these horrific uh, store takeovers uh, and smash and grabs and so forth. It doesn't stop. 7-Elevens. And now you've got 
teenagers on bicycles, on bicycles, going into a 7-Eleven and looting the place. I mean, kids on bicycles are like probably 10, 12, 13, 14 years old. They're going to this looting of stores. It's, it's unprecedented that it's gotten to that degree. Uh, parents obviously watch their children. Uh, some of these situations took place. That the parents took the children down to the police when they found that their child had been involved in that. But there's got to be consequences when you commit crime. And unfortunately, what our current district attorney, there is no consequence. And that's the problem. That's why we need to get a new district attorney to make it safe for everyone, from little children to know there's consequences when you don't yeah. do what you need to do. Plain and simple. That's all we need to have a happy society. What happened to those kids, by the way, that got turned in? Anything? Well, they got turned in. They got processed. Some were booked for robbery. Uh, they'll go through the criminal justice system. I commend the parents for doing this, but the parents need yeah. to be cautious with their children go out. And when they do something like that, I commend the parents for that. But the kids are now going to have a juvenile record, which doesn't look good on their reputation. The Honorable Dennis Zine, former LAPD sergeant, longtime LAPD reserve officer with 56 years of service to the City of Angels. And we salute you, uh, Dennis Zine, and thank you very much uh, for coming to the line this afternoon. Pleasure being with you, Frank. Thank you, and good day to your listeners. Thank you very much. Dennis Zine on the line on 790 KBC. Moteca Money continues here in 790 KBC. Nervous night in Florida with the approach of Hurricane Milton approaching the Gulf Coast of Florida. That's the west coast of Florida with the devastating winds. Looks like the storm is making a hard right turn and looks like um, may make landfall near Sarasota County, north of the Tampa Bay area. We continue to track the storm here along with our friends in Florida with Hurricane Milton set to hit Florida in the coming hours. All sorts of businesses will be affected. Travel plans have been Upended theme parks, airports, and ports in Florida have shut down. And uh, for cruise passengers, many sailings that would have been in the path of the storm are still happening, but changes in the itineraries. And let's bring in the expert on all of this now, and that is the cruise guy himself, Stuart Sheeran, the president of CruiseGuy.com, who happens to be in the South Florida area. Sir, thank you very much uh, for taking the call, and tell us uh, what is the situation there at the moment. Well, uh, as you reported, uh, Sarasota, which is actually south of Tampa, um, is uh, is about to get uh, the the eye of the storm is about to come ashore. Um, they've been getting battered for the last several hours. Uh, winds are up to 120 miles an hour. Hopefully, people along the the west coast uh, heeded the warnings to to get out. Uh, you know, as you know, about uh, 10 days ago or so, they uh, had some of the uh, fringe um, impacts from Hurricane Helene uh, when she passed by. So it's unfortunately a double whammy for them. But uh, the East Coast Ford is doing well, and, and the other good news is, uh, you know, some people are concerned about, let's say, some people have mentioned, well, is it safe to cruise during hurricane season? The answer is yes. Um, the, the ships have the very best weather tracking equipment on board. Uh, they do work with and supply information with the National Hurricane Center, and uh, they can stay clear of the storm. So uh, to give you an example, uh, Princess Cruises' uh, brand-new uh, Sun Princess, which uh, debuted in February, in uh, the Mediterranean, is supposed to make her U.S. Uh, debut arrival today at, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, but uh, she had to remain at sea uh, as the ports were closed today. So right now she's um, sailing comfortably off the uh, northern coast of Cuba and uh, will make her way once the ports open and uh, more than likely will arrive on Friday instead. Well, of course, uh, Princess Cruz is based here in uh, Southern California, so we wish uh, Godspeed to the the uh, the flagship of the fleet now, uh, one of the love boats. So uh, that is uh, important news that you're sharing with us. And and um, so it must be a, a tremendous uh, effort to um, uh, with the ships at, at sea to, to keep them away from uh, from all this uh, rough weather, Stuart, uh, and just you uh, keeping track of all this for us. Well, it's you know there, there's a lot of ships, and uh, you know it's, it's we're getting into the peak of the season. Ships are uh, thankfully full. People are out having a good time, but. You know, when you know, when you're dealing with the storms, they sometimes have to make schedule changes. Um, rarely does it impact the arrivals and departures, but unfortunately, for some ships, it it tends to keep them at sea. So some some cruises may be lengthened, some may be shortened. Airlines do work, and that's you know the the good thing about having uh, you know internet uh, connectivity on board the ships and cell phone service is that uh, you can make uh, arrangements and uh, ahead of time. To, uh, to deal with these, and, and the cruise lines do a really very good job at communicating with the, with passengers, so it, it's a very safe experience. That's good to hear, and um, looks like the uh, the port there in Tampa um, may see a big impact, right? And on the other side of the state, uh, Port Canaveral, uh, 
right? Uh, what are the um, what's the outlook for these uh, these important ports uh, for the cruise uh, industry? Yeah, well, you know, Port Canaveral is the second busiest port in the world uh, behind Miami, and uh, you know it, it is being closed. Uh, you know, the Kennedy Space Center they were supposed to actually launch um, a Falcon Heavy uh, this week, so those have all been delayed. And uh, you know, the ships that are supposed to be coming into Canaveral um, won't will probably get in on Friday at the earliest. Um, some may have to wait until Saturday. Uh, Tampa Bay is dealing with its its second storm, and uh, you know they have to. The Coast Guard has to send out crews in order to um, assess uh, any any damage before they can allow the ships to come back in. So, uh, you know, it'll be it'll be Friday at the earliest. So, airports, cruise ports, and spaceports all being impacted by Hurricane Milton. Already, we're getting reports of uh, tornadoes spawning. Throughout yeah. uh, the state, um, uh, what is, you're in the Miami area, right? Uh, luckily, not in the path uh, of this one. No, uh, thankfully, um, we did have. Uh, there was a lot of low pressure. Uh, we did have a low pressure system, so we've been, we've been having rain for uh, about four or five days. But uh, it actually let up today. Uh, I was able to get out and play a little tennis. Um, it, you know, we had uh, some wind gusts. You know, you saw clouds moving uh, to the east and then to the north. Um, there were some tornadoes sighted um, in Fort Lauderdale, actually, Broward County along uh, Interstate 75. But, um, you know, and then several up in the, uh, you know, uh, central area, um, they were seeing some storms. And, you know, they're just worried about the storm surge, um, you know, from Tampa all the way down to uh, Naples. And then, you know, on the other side of the coast, uh, we're dealing with uh, Daytona up to Jacksonville. Uh, when the storm emerges, uh, hopefully uh, as a Category 1 from a Category 3. Stuart, thank you very much for taking the call. We'll let you get back to your uh, important work and taking care of all your great customers. And for anyone that wants some more information, go to cruiseguy.com. That is the cruise guy himself, Stuart Sheeran, president of cruiseguy.com, live with us here on Motac on Money on 790 KBC. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang, and I'll be back Tomorrow with more at 4 right here on Motac on Money on 790 KBC. The Jim Jackson Show isn't just another NBA podcast. Of course, I'll break down everything about the league that I played in for 14 years and now cover as a broadcaster. There will be plenty of interviews with the biggest players, personalities, and insiders in the NBA. I say there's more to life than ball. That's why on this podcast, I'm going to delve into other passions, maybe business and maybe travel. I love lifestyle. The Jim Jackson Show, wherever you listen.